Hi, uh, welcome to Gurkhan. I'm Andy Mansfield from uh, Juniper Networks. I'm on SE. I specialize in the uh, security line. Have about 10 years of managing uh, networks for a managed hosting provider. Just moved on over to Juniper recently. So they asked me to come out here and give a little talk. One of the things I did a lot in the past was uh, manage the uh, enterprise WAN for big, small, you know, all companies. So I figured I'd talk about a few of the things. Um, it's going to be a little salesy, I'm sorry. And I didn't get permission to do anything cool. But we're uh, going to go through it. There's a couple of new products I'm going to talk about down at the end of the line. So one of the things we all know is that there's 54% of the data breaches are happening to the servers that we manage. There's 60% of breaches took weeks or months to discover. So uh, there's a lot of hacking going on from all over the place. There's, you know, frequent every seven minutes and all that jazz. So uh, there's a lot of things that we're going to have to be careful of nowadays, especially because it's costing us all money and keeping us up at night and uh, keeping us busy. And one thing I've noticed, like the server field, everything is pretty cyclical in regards to how WANs are managed. It used to be the old, uh, you know, everything's tunneled back to the remote sites up through an MPLS cloud to a router that's directly hit over to the server so there's no latency between the users and the uh, applications that they're trying to get at. And then the only firewall was really between the uh, the internet and those servers. So there was no real protection from the uh, edge sites where people are bringing in their laptops, their phones, all those other things that could be already compromised and all of that. Um, in addition to that, uh, the cost of MPLS lines is getting more and more expensive whereas local internet is much, much cheaper. So I've seen a lot more companies moving towards this model where there's a local firewall at each site that's kind of making decisions in regards to what path the data is going to follow. Everybody's getting a local like Comcast or some sort of DSL line and just funneling internet traffic out there, and especially with the advent of things like uh, Office 365 and all these other things. Um, a lot of local internet's happening. So uh, in addition to the one big firewall that they're also placing between the users and the servers now and the internet, there's also all those other smaller firewalls and security devices out at the edge sites. And in addition to the services they provide, it gives guys like me and maybe some of you guys a whole lot more work to do in regards to managing all these devices. So one of the things Juniper has moved to is uh, central management with a security director in space, which is our overall management platform. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that space does is it makes it real easy to see uh, you have one central pane of glass to manage all your devices. You can apply um, profiles. So in regards to the second slide I showed of the network, uh, there's a certain set of policies and profiles you're going to want to apply to every site, but you don't necessarily want to have to manage them all individually. So what you can do is just set it up as a profile and say every site gets this set of policies. Um, I'm a CLI guy myself. However, there's certain points that the nice GUI is, is helpful for just at a glance or letting your junior guys do the work for you. Um, so it's another... Um, just view of the, the rules. The other nice thing that they're adding into it is we want to see beyond just what sites are using what kind of data or what, what bandwidth. We want to be able to see who's using what applications, what applications are using most of the pipe. And most of that's available through the CLI, but there's nothing beats a GUI for uh, just quick little dive down. I mean, we're all using Splunk and things like that now to look at our logs as opposed to just streaming the uh, syslog pi, you know, using tail or something like that. So the, the central management really helps with, you know, the high level insights of uh, all the different uses that are going on in the WAN so you can be sure of what's going on and how to make all that happen. Uh, the other thing that's nice with the central management is a threat map. Um, we know that nothing good's coming from South Korea, nothing good's coming from China or Russia. So being able to see the where your traffic's coming from and be able to hover over the region, dive down a little bit deeper, see what's going on, it's pretty helpful. From there, uh, we just have the basic dashboard that 
has a lot of different options for different users. Uh, you get, there's over 38 widgets that you can set up on your own personal dashboard to be able to uh, get the information that you want at the, the front. And then the other nice thing is, uh, much like a lot of the SIEM tools you're used to, we're moving towards a, a visual representation of the event logs. Uh, there's a time span selector. You can dive down in by clicking on the different sites. Obviously, the uh, the different uh, utilizations show up in different colors that you really make it stand out for you. Um, you can check out the trends and the aggregation. Uh, and drill down in, as I was saying, and then the different GRP country flags and uh, the ability to just do some quick scanning. So that's just a real high-level overview of what we're doing with the central management of the Layer 7 security. So um, I know everybody thinks of Juniper as the, uh, the backbone of the internet, and we're pretty strong in the switching market, but my own personal opinion, I know the SRX has taken some hits back in the day, but they've definitely moved a whole lot of improvement into that line uh, with the spinning off the, off of the Pulse product. Everybody's dove on the SRX and the ad advances that have come through of it have been pretty nice. So along with the, um, with the device being a, a really functional high-end router uh, with everything up to and including MPLS, the Layer 7 inspection and ancillary security services it's it's pretty much an all-in-wonder box. So everything from the app track to see which applications are being used uh, to the app firewall, which is pretty nice. Uh, instead of just saying, hey, port 80 is blocked or open, we can say Facebook post isn't cool, but YouTube watching is. Uh, being able to throttle uh, the, the applications based on what they are as opposed to just the port is nice with the app QoS. But the two that I'm really going to focus on more of today is the IPS, well, more than two, the UTM and the security intelligence, Sky, um, uh, advanced threat protection, and the SSL proxy, which is an extremely nice functionality in regards to being able to take a look into the, uh, into the uh, encrypted sessions that are going through the device. So basically what this is, just an overview of the uh, the packet path throughout the SRX as it's diving in. So you got all your basics of, you know, screens, which is a basic layer two security uh, through the NATs and all the other zones. Um, what we have is we've dove in with the application identification, which is helping us to enable the deeper control over what's going on on our networks. So I'm just going to skim through this uh, just exactly uh, where it goes, but in that last step there of the services, that's where we hit that full suite of advanced security uh, uh, functionality. Now, this is a, a basic flowchart that shows uh, how the app ID works. So it's going to do a full check through the entire packet and make sure that it does everything it can to identify the actual application, and it's not going to let some evasion techniques throw it off. Um, so it's going through the ICMP first, and clearly it tries to identify it if it's that. If it's not the ICMP, it's going to go through other known protocols and dive down deep in. So what this slide's really showing is that we're going to dig deep and make sure we know what we're dealing with. Um, this just shows an overall uh, screenshot from Space and Security Director that kind of shows the, the options that are available with the app firewall and the IPS. So as you can see, it's not just saying HTTP or SMTP. It's actually diving into the showing it's Adobe Connect or, or uh, you know, Adult Friend Finder. I know the sales department uses that quite frequently at most or most offices. But the more important thing that we're dealing with is the SSL proxy. So what you'll see is if it's an outbound connection from a user to the internet, the SRX will actually intercept that SSL connection and perform a man in the middle. So it'll decrypt between the user and the SRX, look through the packet, re-encrypt and uh, complete the connection out to the server. That way it gets an actual deep insight into what's going on. So there's no tunneling over SSL that you know you can quickly evade most other uh, products. And then also on the way back in, it's going to do the same thing. So if you have a web server behind the SRX that's hosting an SSL web page, 
it's going to, you, you know, go ahead and load the cert on the SRX. It's going to decrypt, inspect, pass it along, and we're just going to make sure that, um, that nothing bad's getting through. So, <clears throat> one thing that Juniper does that kind of leverages us from the competition is we have a dedicated team that's set to researching the vulnerabilities and the emerging th uh, threats. Um, clearly, we're, uh, we're, uh, in the industry leading response time due to our uh, release of signature updates, which are daily, even down to the hours and minutes for emergencies. And we also have an open signature database. I just want to run through some uh, use cases that we all have seen before and that we know about. Um, so we've got the server protection, which, you know, is from the internet down into the server. We've got the uh, client protection, which is Everybody's bringing their laptops into the office now, right? You don't know what they've picked up at home and what they're going to be bringing into your network. So you're kind of protecting the users or the service from your users also. And then on top of that, we've got just user to user internal attacks that we're, we're keeping an eye out for. So when we're dealing with the IPS, there is a, a ridiculous amount of signatures out there that none of us want to manage by hand. And what the uh, space uh, plugin does is it kind of makes it easy because we can sort by groups, be they uh, applications, category, severity. Um, then one of the really nice features is recommended, uh, which is somebody else is making the decisions as to what they think you need to protect against and what you might not need to because that's a couple of full-time jobs in and of itself of understanding what's actually a threat, what's a false positive, what's a real positive, moving on from there. Um, another search functionality that we have is by keyword CVE ID, which has been quite helpful for me in the past of a customer looking around on the internet, getting a report of, hey, this bug's out there, how are you gonna protect it? And I could just go ahead and search by that bug and go, here you go, it's protected. And then also by bug track, which is a, a nice one. The other thing is we have the uh, open attack database. so. Uh, the attacks are written to protect against vulnerabilities rather than a, a specific exploit, which means everybody's heard of like the LOIC or something along those lines. So instead of trying to identify the actual script that's being run, we're going to look at how the vulnerability is functioning and protect against any tool that's attacking that as opposed to a specific tool. Now, the other nice thing in the differentiation between us and a lot of other uh, IPS devices out there is um, you don't have to run it through all connections just to focus on specific attacks, right? So with it being later in here with the uh, with the firewall policies itself, as it uh, uh, packets running through the protection algorithm, it's going to hit a policy and it's only being called if it's on HTTP, uh, HTTP or HTTPS, and that's where we're going to look for the the Facebook and YouTubes and things like that, not necessarily on other ones, but that's all up to the individual uh, uh, network admin to go ahead and make their decisions as to how they want to apply it, but it definitely makes it easy for us. And the real nice thing, especially for a lot of you guys out there, is we have the ability to uh, pull PCAPs for analysis after the fact. So if our device recognizes an attack is happening, you can go ahead and set it up to pull a PCAP and send it off to you. So you can run it through any forensics that you want later on. Uh, and there's clearly a, a full suite of those tools available. Uh, the UTM architecture is pretty, pretty simple in regards to <clears throat> the full uh, uh, antivirus, anti-spam, uh, web filtering. Uh, you guys all know how this works. Uh, the Enhanced web filtering is basically just showing you it's going to go through the engine of uh, identifying based on either URL or activity. Uh, the new anti-malware is uh, it's purpose-built for the edge devices uh, in regards to uh, it's looking more for attacks on individual computers as opposed to servers, things along those lines. Um, but onto the device or the products that I really wanted to talk about. So the security intelligence, it's a platform that connects 
a whole lot of ideas together. So we've got space as a central management platform with security director and the SRX are doing the work. But there's also uh, a VM that runs that's called uh, Second Teller, uh, uh, the uh, Spotlight Connector. And what it does is it, it, it ties everything together. What it boils down to is there's a Spotlight Secure uh, service that runs in the cloud uh, and that reaches out to the connector. The connector is kind of the central point of between security director, the SRX, the user or the admins and Spotlight Secure. And what this does is we all know that there's a list of um, known bad guys out there for lack of a better way to say it. And what the connector does is it, it pulls from multiple different lists of command and control servers from GRIP lists. Uh, then you can also do custom black and white lists. And the really nice thing is this happens every 15, 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, the, uh, so the firewall is making the decisions as to if it's blocked or not. The connector is pulling all of the information together. Security director is where you manage it from. Spotlight Secure is the, uh, the cloud-based um, uh, service that's a third party. It's kind of your own additional security department that's out there identifying threats and things along those lines. The overview of how it all works is right here where the connector is pulling from Spotlight Secure from the API feeds. And that's actually something I should dive into. So all of these things combined is what we put in the box for you. But along the lines of everything that Juniper does, there is an open API. So you can write your own scripts to go out and pull from your own sources and uh, push in the different uh, rules as you want. And in regards to the, uh, the, the enterprise WAN and why this is nice is, Let's say that you find that there is one specific site that's attacking one location. You go ahead and update just the, the, the connector. The connector pushes this out to all the individual firewalls immediately on your own without a, uh, a commit or without any real config changes. It's just real time, pushes it out, and all those other sites are protected from that one attacker that you're aware of. Um, so. As I just said, the uh, it happens without the commits, and uh, the second tell receives the dynamic feeds from all the different sources that we've spoken of, uh, from the cloud, from your own lists, and uh, it's continuously updated with a full team of people, 24/7, getting those uh, lists populated. Um, it, it, the the platform itself. It gives us the, the flexibility to add your own information, as I was saying, either through the APIs, through the whitelist, or through the connector itself. And, uh, <clears throat> going over that. So, I'd love to be able to give you the list of where we're getting that information from. However, it's confidential for, for multiple reasons. But there's a, a full security suite of people and, uh, Organizations out there feeding us its information, and one of those uh, one of those sources is what I'm going to be getting to in a minute of a different uh, application that we're going to be putting into here. So the uh, the custom black and white lists you can do CSV formatted lists, uh, which is pretty nice for having one department going ahead and. Uh, keeping track of what's good and what's bad, pulling from your seam, you can get uh, output from that. And really push the limits as to how you're gonna pull this with the API, because you can take the information from anywhere and really uh, get a list of what's bad and what's good. All right, so some of the use cases are gonna be pretty, uh, pretty simple in regards to uh, the uh, the user protection. So one of the main things and that we're always looking for, especially with the remote users on a enterprise WAN, are command and control nodes. So what'll happen is you'll be using your device at home, pick up some 
some gunk, some malware, something like that. And the m number one indicator of that is reaching back out to a botnet uh, command and control node. So we're keeping a list of those together, and that's the number one list of uh, of things that, of devices that will identify as being bad. And uh, clearly, we push that all back through the control node and uh, feed the rules as we go along. Uh, we can pull this in from an existing WAF or IDS, so it doesn't even have to be necessarily a Juniper gear, uh, and it's all tied together in that regard. Uh, one of the other nice things that this can do is not just identify remote devices that are bad, but once we do see that a, a device internally is uh, infected, it can update your firewall rules to block that user from reaching anything else as opposed to even just anything on the outside world. Um, running a little on time, so I'm trying to get up to, I think we get all of this. All right, so this is the other uh, uh, platform that is going to really help us feed into the list of, I'm gonna keep calling it bad guys because it's easier to say is the Sky Advanced Threat Protection. Um, what Sky Advanced Threat Protection is, is it's beyond your typical intrusion detection. Uh, a little bit ago, Juniper bought a company called Mykonos, and their big thing was as opposed to intrusion prevention or detection, but deception. And what it will do is, um, there's a chain of techniques that uh, we put together to collect information. So instead of just blocking a, an attack and uh, pushing that off the side and having the attacker just change their tactics, what it's gonna do is it's gonna funnel them off to a sandbox and it's going to keep giving them uh, uh, um, what's the word? Uh, it's gonna keep bringing them in deeper, uh, giving them more and more things to uh, try to attack. That way we can further fingerprint them and add them to our list of, uh, of known offenders. And the thing that's nice about that is it's off to the side, it gets pushed up through a whole different cloud service, it's unknown to the attacker, and um, um, it'll, uh, <clears throat> it just keeps them busy as opposed to blocking it and also allows us to identify and fingerprint the new tools and uh, attacks as they come. The other thing that this does is uh, it caches the, the lookups so they can be uh, completed in under uh, two minutes. There's a series of AV engines that run up in the cloud also. So generally the, the known virus and malware can be identified in under 10 seconds. Then there's a static analysis. But what really, really sets us apart is the ability to recognize unknown zero day attacks and begin to fingerprint them and add them into our list of known attacks by uh, using machine learning to really do the, uh, the isolation of attackers uh, and attacks. So the first thing that happens is the attack will come through and it'll be checked for a cache and stack of anal static analysis and if it's blocked, nice. If not, it's gonna keep going on to the dynamic analysis uh, from there. There's, that's businessy stuff. And then it also pushes back into that, uh, that spotlight secure system that I was speaking of before with the full list of already known command and control and uh, GIP and custom lists along those lines. And it's going to continue sandboxing it and using the remote analytics to identify what's going on. Um, where's the slide that I really wanna to get to before I gotta go? Here's the one. So one of the really nice things that'll happen with the uh, advanced threat protection is before it lets a download complete, if the SRX identifies it as being a, a malicious file, it's going to hold the last few packets. So the device, the end computer never actually receives the full package and so it can't really be infected. The other thing that's nice is there's always that fine line between security and functionality. So there's a tunable function for 
if it's going to take a little bit too long, it'll go ahead and let the, uh, the download go through, but it'll still continue processing it and identifying what's bad and uh, alert your, uh, your engineers so they can go investigate the device later. And um, if it then finds that the download that went through was bad, it will go ahead and block traffic from that site source or that file for future uses. Um, so, I mean, we get all this together. So instead of uh, going on further with that, anybody have any questions? I know I ran through a whole bunch real quick and a lot of it you've heard before, but is there anything? Yes. Did you say, is there a built-in functionality for bringing in new lists, you said? What kind of devices are you referring to? Yes, so anything that's going to be flowing through the firewall uh, or the, the SRX, which would be the, the center point for actually watching that, um, you can use all the API hooks for any and all information that you want. So if, if a new IP comes through, if a new Mac comes through, you can go ahead and write a script to pull that in and populate the, uh, the bad guy list. I'm sorry. Yes. Very much so. I think I saw another hand. No? No more? All right. Well, I've also been asked to invite you all to go by the, uh, Great Lakes computer booth. They're giving away a drone. Uh, you have to stop by and sign up. Uh, for right now, and then there's an after party tonight at the Bob from 6 to 9 on the third floor. So come by for some drinks and food and have some fun. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>